Hello, you may have seen me present the first few episodes of 50 Days, but for those of you who don't know me, I'm the director of 50 Days, Jess Blissett. And I just wanted to let you know that this week we will be airing both last week's episode and on immigration and this week's episode on gender politics. Be sure to tune in on election night as we'll be reporting live from Media City on the first results on Keys TV's Instagram channel. We hope to see you soon and enjoy the show. Good evening and welcome to 50 Days. With less than 11 days to go until the presidential election, I'm Ben Cook. And I'm Caitlin Lang. In today's episode, Jonah Hall will be taking us through a few stories exploring how migrants have settled into Chicago, the Windy City. And after that, we will be taking a look at Diana Zhikalova's journey after finding love and a life for herself more than 5,000 miles away from where she was born. But to start, of, to start us off, as always, it's Rosa with a statistical breakdown of the election so far. Over to you, Rosa. Thanks, Caitlin. So, welcome back, and this is our second to last episode until the election. Very similar story in the national polls as the last few weeks. As you can see here, the gap between Trump and Kamala has almost closed, and things are still very uncertain. We've got 48.1 for Harris on 538, and we've got 46.4 for Trump. So, next week, in the run-up to election day, I'll be playing around with scenarios, showing you the different paths to victory for either candidate. My plan is to equip you with the ability to track the election because it's all well and good staying up to watch, but it helps to know what results mean. For example, what is Trump's path to victory if he loses North Carolina? It's good to know that. So this week, however, I'm going to do a whistle stop tour of the rest of the swing states. I'll show you polling one or two key groups who Harris or Trump will have to convince in order to win the election. So as quick as we can, Here's Arizona. In 2020, Biden was the first Democrat in a quarter of a century to win the state. This was primarily because of change within city areas. Here, it was Maricopa County containing the city of Phoenix and its surrounding suburbs right in the center here. One element was arguably young people moving both to the city and out to the suburbs, but the key demographic to watch out for here was actually moderate Republicans. So here's the polling. Trump is not comfortably ahead, but he's certainly ahead. In the last election, the anti-Trump sentiment was a lot more omnipresent, and it felt in so many places like that people only wanted to vote out Trump primarily. It caused many Republicans to abandon Trump and the party. Senator John McCain was big in Arizona in his lifetime, and he arguably stood for a more moderate Republicanism than Trump. In 2020, Biden only won this state by 11,000 votes. Whereas in the Republican primaries, Nikki Haley, Trump's more moderate opposition, received 110,000 votes in Arizona. This suggests, as you can see on the next slide, there's a number of Republicans who really didn't want Trump and they could be convinced by Kamala. As you can see here, I'm a former Trump voter. I'm a Republican. I'm voting for Harris, Stacey in Arizona. So we're gonna move swiftly on. We have Nevada next. Another desert state, and here's the top word, uncertainty. Here in 538 on the next poll, Kamala is only one decimal point ahead, uncertain. Many polls are putting Trump ahead, uncertain. Campaigners on the ground cannot stress enough how unsure they are about the result either way. The key demographic to get here is, would you believe it, uncertain voters, not just uncertain, but specifically independents. So Politico have reported that registered independents now slightly outnumber registered Democrats and Republicans in the state. There is a lot of concern around inflation from working class people in insecure work in places such as Las Vegas. As we've said before in previous weeks, this is not ideal for Kamala as a member of the incumbent government. This includes a significant demographic of Hispanic voters, which again brings us back to previous weeks with the strategies of meeting them where they are, Spanish language ads and Spanish door knocking. So I'm going to keep going because it's a similar story everywhere. Next up, we have Michigan. So Michigan is strong with the unions and traditionally this would lead to the Democrats. 
However, it's super, super tight at the moment. As you can see in this next slide, Kamala is reaching ever so slightly ahead in Michigan. We've got 47.4 to 47.2, another 538 poll there. And her clearest path to victory is maintaining the blue wall. So the blue wall would be the Great Lakes states. It would mean Pennsylvania. It would mean Wisconsin. And it would mean Michigan. If she lost all the other swing states and maintained, a, th maintained the stronger Democrat states that Biden won, she will win. However, she has been doing worse than Biden with African-American voters. And this has been a concern for her campaign. Added to this, it was Hillary who ran into trouble in 2016 with white voters without college degrees. Both of these demographics are strongholds in Michigan. So as you can see in this next slide, I've got a little photo here, car manufacturing. Michigan is a factory state. The car manufacturing industry is huge. This should work in the Democrats' favor. Again, pro-union, it stands to reason that people would be voting Democrat. However, they would have to prove themselves good for workers. Trump has been sowing the seeds of doubt in this area. Again, the economy comes in. He's referencing Kamala's plans surrounding electric vehicle production. He claims that this could affect the industry. With this decision, people may be out of work. We'll have to wait and see whether that actually would be the case were she to get in or what Trump would do to rectify that were he to get in. So finally, very, very quickly, we have Wisconsin. Kamala is ahead, but you can never be too sure. Um, as you can see on the next slide here, the polling is showing a very similar story. We've got Harris at 47.8 and Trump at 47.4. So very tight again, but one place I'd particularly like to focus on is Door County. This is a bellwether county, by which we mean it has voted for the winner of the election for the past 20 years. So next here, I've got a picture of this gorgeous part of Wisconsin. It's a true purple county, so it's swung back and forth, but it's worth keeping an eye on election night as they might tell you who wins. The demographic is a mix of conservative and rural farmers who, and then incomers who vote more, demograph more democratic. I apologize. However, it's never as simple as that. And there are families who vote differently and more. So that is all the swing states I have time for. I'll be back next week to give you any final polling before the election and to give you more to look out for on election night. Back to you, Caitlin and Ben. So now we know a bit more about the states that could make or break this election, but how will the next president of the United States address the growing concern of immigration in today's America? Up next is our political correspondent, Jess Blissett, to discuss Harris and Trump's policies on immigration respectively, and how it affects the, people, the American people on a surface level. Let's have a look at that now. Thanks, Caitlin and Ben. Um, in today's America, immigration is a growing concern for them. In fact, six out of 10 Americans and registered voters claimed that immigration was a very important topic for them, depending on how they would vote. And a fear of immigration lies in the stem of Trump's rhetoric. Many government officials over time have used this to explain the increasing growth in domestic crime, drug issues, and economy. I try not to get too political because I am not from this country and um, people fight about this. U.S. border officials record encounters with migrants. These include people who attempted to cross illegally and people who tried to enter legally but were deemed inadmissible. The unauthorized immigration population in the United States grew to 11 million in 2022, an increase from the 10.5 million in 2021. And since January 2021, when Joe Biden came into office, there have been more than 10 million encounters, about 8 million external came over the southwest land border with Mexico. Under the Trump administration, there were 2.4 million encounters on this border, with encounters falling at the start of 2020 and with the COVID pandemic. The US Department of Homeland Security has estimated there were 11 million illegal migrants externally living in the US as of January 2020. It says about a fifth of them arrived in 2010 or later, but the majority arrived before this time, some as early as the 1980s. Diana moved to Philadelphia in 2021 and is currently living in Boston where she is finishing her master's. Hi, I'm Diana. I am currently living in the United States and before that, I lived in Hong Kong and France. Originally, I'm from Kazakhstan. And the reason why I've been moving so much um, 
is primarily because I prioritize my education and try to learn something new every day. I'm really curious and I love meeting new people. I enjoy um, learning about new cultures and discovering um, new places. Looking at Rosa's stats, polling suggests voters trust Trump more to handle the issue of immigration than Harris, with Trump's first administration, which tried to use the possibility of removing children from their parents to deter illegal border crossings. Right now I'm staying in the US because I think it's a valuable asset working here and starting your career here, um, especially if you're in business. I think it's a great opportunity and U.S. gives you plenty of opportunities to really grow as a professional. Um, and there's always something going on, um, which I really appreciate, which, and that is why I decided that I'm going to stay. Um, I'm actually given a three-year working visa upon graduation. And I just don't think it's worth wasting it. Miss Harris's immigration policy would, would largely be one of continuity, opening up new legal pathways for migrants where possible, while restricting asylum at the southern border. One thing that I really liked about living in the US is that I could travel so easily and traveling within the US was very a, a very interesting experience on its own because every state is so different from one another. I've, uh, in my first year, I've got to travel to Boston, um, Miami, Chicago, San Francisco, LA, and all of these places were incredibly, incredibly rich in experiences and um, history. And I really felt like um, I could travel and do what I liked the most without applying for visa and paying a lot of money for hotels and flights. Um, another reason why I really wanted to live in the US is because I felt welcomed here and I felt like people were very nice to me a lot of the times. A lot of Americans will deny that, but I f feel like this is the place that I would want to be in. Uh, very positive environment, very grateful people. Three quarters of voters say they don't say undocumented immigrants fill jobs citizens don't want, while a lower share say that the same of legal immigrants, according to the Pew Research Center. I have very mixed feelings about immigration. I think it is great that they give opportunities for international students to even start their um, careers here. But there is also a very long process of actually getting to the point where um, you are working in a nice company, stress-free, because um, pretty much the whole journey is, it feels like there's a lot of uncertainties, there's a lot of applications to go through, there is a lot of um, aspects that can affect your um, situation. For instance, if you're applying for OPT, um, there are only 90 days after graduation that you are um, allowed to stay in the country. And if you haven't found a job within that period, you have to leave the country. And because the job market is so competitive right now, um, it is really hard for international students to find jobs here within that period. Um, and then once you found a job, um, a year after that, assuming you extended your OPT, which is an optional practical training, um, then you have to apply for another visa. But once you apply, you're basically entering a lottery. And if you won that lottery, you can, you can work for at least six years, I believe. But there is not a lot of, there, there aren't a lot of visas that they are um, offering, so. Most immigrants are in the country legally, at least 70%, 77%. 
as of 2022, 49% were naturalised US citizens, 24% were lawful permanent residents, 4% were legal temporary residents, and 23% were unauthorised immigrants. Lawful immigrants made up the majority of the immigrant workforce at 22.2 million, representing about 13% of all workers. A 2011 survey found that the top 50 venture capital funded companies had at least one immigrant founder and these quarters had immigrants in top management or research positions. I try not to get too political because I am not from this country and um, people fight about this a lot. Um, But I will say that I really hope that Kamala Harris uh, wins the election because I genuinely believe that she is the future and that she will make this uh, a country full of opportunities again. Just like she says, um, I really trust that. I think there is a lot of potential uh, behind her. And when it comes to um, Donald Trump, I um, I don't have a lot, a lot to say. I just, I just think it's going to be a lot harder to stay in this country if um, he's elected. In a Texas study, undocumented immigrants were found to be 47% less likely to be convicted of a crime in 2017 than native-born Americans. Yet in the Vance Waltz debate, Vance mentioned in reference to the historic immigration crisis, arguing that Kamala Harris was letting fentanyl into our communities at record levels. However, the United States Sentencing Commission found that 86% of people convicted of trafficking fentanyl were actually US citizens driving cars and commercial vehicles through legal ports of entry. Yet, Trump continues to rally this fear of immigration. But how does this affect us? Well... A third of voters in the British election voted for Reform UK, with their leader, Nigel Farage, promising a freeze on immigration. And in fact, from 2019 to 2022, all continents of the world have seen an increase in immigration population. So I sat down with Claudia, um, who came into the UK in December 2005 from Poland. Claudia has recently acquired a bachelor's degree from the University of Oxford in philosophy, politics and economics and is now a master's student here at the University of Salford studying journalism. Hi Claudia. Hi Jess. So can you tell me a bit about when you came first into the country? Um, so I first came in December 2005 following my parents who came at the beginning of, beginning of 2005. Um, So my dad came first, um, started working at a factory and he lived in a room with my mum's cousin and his wife (laughs) and my mum's sister and they were all just trying to kind of get by. Um, He was packing fruit and vegetable um, in a factory for Asda um, and he would be sending us money back to Poland. So whereabouts in Poland are you originally from? Um, I'm originally from Bydgoszcz which is about two hours south from Gdańsk. Mm -hmm. And what can you tell me a bit about um, your hometown, things that you liked, miss? Um, I mainly miss my family. Um, My grandparents, my aunties and uncles and cousins, they all live um, there still, and I miss being able to hang out with my cousins. Um, How old are your cousins? Um, I've got a lot of cousins. Um, My youngest one is currently four and my oldest one is 29. And is there anything like specific about the place, I guess, just things like that? Is there anything that's like very different from Leeds? Um, I think um, one thing that stands out to me is the architecture. It's a lot more colourful. Yeah. um, A lot more green spaces. Any Uh, examples you can think of? Um... I've always really liked um, the bridge near the st- statue of um, the Archeress. Mm-hmm. Um, it's always very peaceful there. Um, and you can see all the boats going down the river. Yeah. I know that it was a long time ago, but what can you remember about your journey from Poland to here? Um, So I remember my mum had just joined my dad. Um, I was only little, but my grandma tells me that I called her on the phone and I was like, mummy, why did you leave me? Oh my gosh. Um, 
and my parents kind of realised at that point that it's not just about making life better for us, specifically in Poland, but um, making life better for us full stop and that would have been here in England. Mm -hmm. um, my mum took the first plane back she could, um, packed a bag for me and we flew over to London and took a really long coach back up to Leeds. Wow. And I've just lived here since. Is there anything that you like in Leeds that, I guess, reminds you of being in Poland? Anything that you find comforting? Um, I live re uh, really close by to a park um, and it's got this big, massive woodland. Um, and I guess that kind of reminds me most of the park from what near I'm from mm -hmm. in Poland. And what's your experience been like specifically dealing with like how people have treated you in Leeds um, what, and in Oxford? What's your experience been like so far? Um, I guess it's been mixed. Um, Leeds does have a large Polish community mm -hmm. um, so there is somewhat more of an acceptance there um, about difference and like celebrating that difference um, but there's also been um, people who are not so happy about I guess as being here. Mm -hmm. um, With both of those things can you think of any examples for me? So firstly talking a bit about you know the big Polish community in Leeds what are some examples you can think of of that? Um, I remember a few years back um, my mum and I and a few of my friends and their mums organised this um, big Eastern European day at mm -hmm. the local church and everyone came together um, whether we were Eastern European, English, West African, um, Jamaican um, that's, gen that's generally the sort of demographic we have in the local area and we all came together and shared lots of really nice food and danced and uh, sung um, and it was really nice to just be able to celebrate that. And more specifically with the kind of hostility you've experienced? Um, I guess one thing that really st stands out to me a lot is um, I'm quite lucky to be able to have developed an English accent um, however my parents having come a bit later in their years um, have kept their Polish accent um, and whenever we'd walk around um, some streets where um, there's particular hostility towards immigrants, my mum would always say to me and my younger brother, um, don't speak to me, speak amongst yourselves in English. Um, and kind of that fear in my mum's eyes of not being able to speak to her own children yeah. um, because of stories that we'd heard about friends and neighbours and articles we'd read about violence towards Polish people um, simply for speaking um, our own language or having a different accent when we speak English. And with the most recent kind of developments of um, right-wing polarisation, how have you felt generally about these things? Has it made you feel a bit more fearful? Um, it has, unfortunately. Um, despite having lived here 19 years now, um, I don't feel perhaps as um, accepted here mm -hmm. um, as I'd quite like to be. Um, I do feel both Polish and English in a sense, but um, that's kind of internally and I, um, it kind of hurts to feel that I'm not part of a community I want to be part of um, and that I'm not accepted um, but also I recognise the fact that until I say what my name is and where I'm from I don't have to deal with that mm -hmm. um, because of my English accent yeah yeah and you spoke a bit about like the things you read online articles do you think that there is a tendency for um, media points and for political points to use immigration as a like a villainized kind of thing like a problem you know for all of their an answer to all of their problems or a you know a source of all their problems when they're not yeah um 
I think so, definitely. Um, immigrants are often used kind of like a scapegoat um, for for when people are not happy with the state of things. That perhaps um, the establishment should be blamed for instead about how things are run. Mm -hmm. um, especially recently with the cost of living crisis, um, immigration has been put forward as kind of the scapegoat for that. Um, that reoccurring argument that immigrants are taking our jobs um, but perhaps people who don't notice that immigrants are also suffering with the cost of living crisis and they're also working hard trying to make ends meet um, mm -hmm. and just because we have a different passport doesn't mean our lives are all sunshines and rainbows at the moment mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of times when media outlets put forward this idea that it's the immigrants taking the jobs, it's the immigrants taking all the benefits, mm -hmm. it's not painting a realistic picture of society and kind of just putting people against other people when it would be much better perhaps to come together and find the real root of the problem. Mm -hmm. And with everything going on in the US, which you see a lot of um, this kind of vilifying immigrants, how would you feel if you were um, an American immigrant dealing with this right now? What would, you know, I guess, how, how do you think it would differ? Do you think there is a large difference between, you know, how we're handling this in, in Britain and in the US? Um, I think with the US, um, there is also that bigger fear of um, violence in terms of uh, guns, guns, gun violence. Um, however, I'm also quite aware of the fact that I'm a white European immigrant um, and regardless of where I am, that does make it easier for me than say um, an immigrant from uh, the Middle East or Africa or Asia mm -hmm. where it's more noticeable mm -hmm. that you're different mm -hmm. um, and I guess uh, it would be especially with the election being current um, it's more scary I guess of your status as an immigrant than it is currently in England with there not being an, an election being held right now. Yeah. Um, although again, going back to um, the right wing riots recently, that has been quite difficult. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claudia, for what you've said. Um, I know it's not necessarily easy to speak about, and I think it says a lot about what we're doing in our current immigration crisis. Um, and I guess it's important to know that things in the US are not necessarily entirely different um, to here. Back to you guys in the studio. Immigration is an incredibly important concern across America and many Americans will be thinking about what we have discussed in today's episode as they head to the polling booths in a couple of weeks time. But that's all from us today. If you would like to get in touch with the team to discuss any of the things we spoke about today in today's show, be sure to follow us on Instagram, TikTok, or email us at 50dayslater at gmail.com. From all of us here, I'm Caitlin Lang. And I'm Ben Cook. Thank you and good night. <laughs>